Good evening. Thanks again to Orangewood Avenue Baptist Church for hosting uh, our two debates, and thanks again to Nadir for uh, defending his views and positions uh, with words and not in certain other ways that other people uh, can defend positions. Last night we saw that Islam clearly calls for violence against non-Muslims, and this puts Muslims in quite a bind here in the West where we value human rights and religious freedom and tolerance. When people compare Islam to other religions, Islam looks extremely violent by comparison. And so if Muslims want us to see Islam in a positive light, they need to even things out a bit. They need to bridge the gap between Islam and its competitors. And Muslim apologists tend to do this by reinterpreting their own texts to make them sound more peaceful, and by attacking the texts of other religions to make them sound more violent. One of the primary tasks of Muslim apologists in the West, then, is to make Jesus sound more like Muhammad, and Muhammad more like Jesus. This is why Nadir put so much effort into convincing us that the Quran's commands to fight unbelievers are actually good, wholesome teachings that are meant to bring about world peace. And it's also why he'll spend a great deal of energy this evening trying to show us that Christianity is somehow violent. Before we turn to the Bible, I want to draw attention to two points of formal agreement between Christians and Muslims. Christians and Muslims agree that God has judged people in the past, sometimes violently. We agree, for instance, that God punished people with a flood during the time of Noah, and that God judged the people of Sodom. We agree that Moses and Joshua conquered various groups. This debate, then, won't be about whether God has judged people. We already agree on that. We also agree that God will judge people in the future. God has been patient with us. He's given us plenty of time to repent and turn to him. But according to both Christianity and Islam, there will come a day when God will judge the world. And it won't be a very fun time for those who have rebelled against the Almighty. So we agree that God has judged people in the past, and we agree that God will judge people in the future. The question before us tonight is whether Christianity, the New Covenant, promotes violence towards non-Christians. There are certainly other important questions that could be asked about uh, ethics and the Bible. We could debate atheism, whether it's fair for God to judge people, or whether it's fair to send people to hell. We could have debates with atheists on whether it was fair to God, fair of God to judge people in the past. Those are important questions, but debates have narrow topics for a reason, and we're here tonight to discuss how, uh, how Christians are commanded to live in this world. Are we called to fight people who disagree with us? Are we told to slay the infidels? Or does Christianity command us to live in peace? Let's turn to our scriptures. In Mark chapter 12, one of the scribes asks Jesus, What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answers, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. Second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the heart of Christian morality, according to Jesus, is love, love for God and love for others. We obey God because we love Him. We care for others because we love them. In the Gospels, Jesus tells us that our lives are to be characterized by gentleness, mercy, and peace. In Matthew 5.5, 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. In 5.7, he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. In 5.9, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Later, in the same chapter, Jesus tells his followers to love everyone, including their enemies. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Love your enemies 
and pray for those who persecute you. In Matthew 26, some soldiers come to capture Jesus, and the apostle Peter pulls out a sword and strikes the servant of the high priest. Jesus says to Peter, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Then Jesus heals the injured man, a man who was part of the group that was conspiring to have him crucified. He heals him. In John 18.36, Jesus is being questioned by Pontius Pilate, who wants to know what Jesus did to upset people so much that they wanted him crucified. Jesus says to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So according to Jesus himself, Christians don't fight people on his behalf because the kingdom of God is not an earthly kingdom. So, do any of these teachings promote violence towards non-Christians? It's exactly the opposite. In fact, this is as peaceful as a religion can possibly be. So it's clear that the Gospels promote nothing but peace towards non-Christians. What about the rest of the New Testament? In Romans 12, the Apostle Paul gives Christians some guidelines about how we're supposed to live. In verse 17, he says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Verse 18, If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men, not with people who agree with you. Be at peace with all men. Verse 19, never take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. Don't retaliate. Let God repay you for the worst. Verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink. Paul tells us to care for our enemies. Jesus said the same thing. In 1 Corinthians 16, 14, Paul says, let all that you do be done in love. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4, it says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We do not war according to the flesh. Why? Because, as Jesus said, his kingdom is not of this world. In Ephesians 5, 2, Christians are commanded to walk in love. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 12, Paul says, May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people. For one another and for all people. In 1 Thessalonians 5.15, Paul commands us to see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. The emphasis on all people, once again. In 1 Timothy 2.1, Paul says to Timothy, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. It obviously includes non-Christians. In Titus 3.2, Paul says that Christians are to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Over and over and over again, Paul tells us to love everyone, to live in peace with everyone, to be gentle towards all everyone. Very different from what we saw in the Quran yesterday. We see the emphasis on peace, gentleness, and love in other New Testament writings as well. The author of Hebrews in 1214 says that Christians are to pursue peace with all men. In James 3, 17 through 18, Jesus' half-brother tells us to seek wisdom from God, and he describes the wisdom that comes from God. He says that the wisdom from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In 1 Peter 2.17, the Apostle Peter tells us to honor all people, not just your fellow Christians, honor all people. In 3.8-9, Peter says that Christians are to be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. He adds in verse 11 that Christians are to turn away from evil and do good, that we are to seek peace and pursue it. 
sum up the position of the New Testament in 1 John 4, 8, the Apostle John says, The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So the Gospels promote peace towards non-Christians, and the rest of the New Testament promotes peace towards non-Christians, which means that we shouldn't even be having this debate. But we've got a little problem. Yesterday, I repeatedly quoted the Quran to Nadir, and it was virtually meaningless to him. I quoted Muhammad to Nadir, and it didn't affect his position at all. I'm guessing that quoting Jesus and the Apostles to Nadir won't matter either. So, when evidence has become irrelevant, how can we debate an issue like this? Well, I think I do have a source that Nadir will respect. It's a quotation from a Muslim, and maybe Nadir will recognize the source. The quotation reads, there's terrorism on both sides. You also have to address the Christian terrorists who are falsely interpreting their scriptures that Jews must invade and take over Arab land. So you've got terrorists on both sides. I don't believe that either terrorists represent what the scripture is teaching. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. The Bible doesn't promote terrorism. The quotation, of course, comes from Nadir last night during the question and answer period. So Jesus tells us to love everyone. The rest of the New Testament tells us to love everyone. And Nadir, at least, admits that Christianity doesn't promote terrorism. Now, I know that Nadir's not going to change his position from less than 24 hours ago. So we could say goodnight and go have some pizza. Unfortunately, some Muslims, unlike Nadir, do claim that Christianity promotes violence towards unbelievers. And instead of acknowledging that Christianity is peaceful, like Nadir did last night, they try to make Christianity sound violent by twisting and distorting the facts. I'd like to respond to them. In their efforts to make Christianity sound more like Islam, Muslims misrepresent Christian doctrine in three important ways. First, Muslims misrepresent the Christian message by distorting certain passages of the New Testament. Let me give you an example. I've seen numerous Muslims claim that Jesus commands his followers to kill people in Luke 19.27. Interestingly, when they make this claim, they only quote verse 27, which says, But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. It's red letter. Jesus said it. Jesus said those words. But... I also just said those words. And if you totally ripped what I just said out of context, you'd say, aha, David just called for the bloody deaths of his enemies. What happens when we read the verse in context? When we read the verse in context, we see that Jesus is telling a story about a ruler. The ruler goes away and then returns to his kingdom, and he calls for judgment on some people who had rebelled against him. Now, in this story, Jesus is telling, it's the ruler who calls for the deaths of his enemies. But Muslims rip it totally out of context, just quote the very last part, and then tell everyone that Jesus is telling this to his followers, and that his followers are therefore supposed to go out and kill people in his name, totally contradicting everything else Jesus said. The fact that Muslims have to so blatantly and deceptively distort this passage in order to make Christianity sound violent shows how desperate some of them are to attack Christianity. As we've already seen, the New Testament calls for peace towards everyone, believer and unbeliever alike. Second, Muslims misrepresent the Christian message by pointing to various groups and individuals who have committed violence in the name of Jesus as if these people are actually following Jesus' commands. But let's be clear here. If someone goes out and kills in the name of Jesus, that person is violating the teachings of Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, then my followers would fight for me. But Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. According to Jesus, Christians are not to fight in his name. According to Paul, we do not war according to the flesh. So, when Muslims point to, say, the Inquisition, 
or various Christians in the world today who commit violence in Jesus' name. This has nothing to do with Christianity promoting violence. It simply shows that not everyone who claims to follow Jesus is actually obeying Jesus. So if you're going to criticize Christianity, you should criticize it based on what it actually teaches, not based on the actions of people who ignore what it teaches. Third, Muslims misrepresent Christianity by ignoring the fact that Christians are under the New Covenant, not the Old Covenant. In the Bible, there are several covenants or agreements between God and men. There's a covenant with Adam. It's in the Bible. You can read it. But I'm not under that covenant. That's a covenant between God and Adam. There's a covenant in the Bible between God and Noah. It's in the Bible. You can quote it. But that is a covenant between God and Noah. There's a covenant with Moses and the Jews. It's in the Bible. You can read about it. But I'm not under that covenant. Then there's a covenant with Christians through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the covenant I'm under. And as a person under this covenant, I have to follow certain rules. I have to be peaceful. I have to love my enemies. I'm not allowed to shed blood for my religion. Now, usually, when Muslims criticize Christianity for being violent, they point to verses in Exodus or Deuteronomy or Chronicles that deal with, say, fighting the Canaanites or some other group, as if Christians are to go out and fight the Canaanites if that's a command directed towards us. Uh, but following that logic, when I open up the Bible and see, build me an ark, I should run out and start building an ark. Why don't we go out and build an ark? Because that command is not directed towards us. It's directed towards someone else. So when Muslims pretend that every command in the Bible is a command of Christians, they simply show their ignorance of what the Bible teaches. To sum up, we've seen that Christians are commanded to live in peace, to pursue peace, to love everyone, even, in our, even our enemies, to do good to everyone, to honor everyone, to pray for everyone, to be merciful, to be gentle, to be compassionate. We're told not to retaliate, not to take revenge, not to hate, not to war according to the flesh, not to fight. And we've seen that the only way to make Christianity sound violent is by misrepresenting it, by distorting the teachings of the New Testament, by pointing out to people who, by pointing to people who violate the commands of Jesus as if they're obeying the commands of Jesus, and by confusing the new covenant with the old covenant. If Nadir can show otherwise, I certainly look forward to responding. Well, I'd like to thank. Uh I'd like to thank David Wood for that. Um, I actually liked what he said. I liked everything what he said, and um, you know, actually, I don't even want to do this debate. It sounded so good. Um, let me pull this back over here. I mean, it really sounded very good, and um, you know, I, I really don't have an intention to. I don't want to win this debate. I hope David Wood wins this debate, but. Um, I don't think everything he said was exactly honest. I think there are issues he's overlooking, and I just kind of would like to talk about some of those. So, you know, he actually quoted many of Well, first of all, let me start off by, uh, I think he misrepresented my argument. I, when I said that Christian, that I don't believe the Bible supports terrorism, it's the specific terrorism of telling Jews that you are supposed to go invade the Middle East steal land away from the Arabs and give it to the Jews and put them inside these concentration camps or these occupied territories. No, I don't believe the Bible teaches that at all. You know, I think this is this is a gross misrepresentation of what the Bible teaches. Um, you know, I'm going to try to be as sympathetic as I can. I'm not going to take my whole 15 minutes, you know, because I want to be as, or my whole 18 minutes, I want to be as sympathetic as I can to uh, what David's saying. Uh, he said, uh, let me start off by kind of quoting some of the verses he said. He said, the Bible teaches to be at peace with all men. You know, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. And I want you to take notice how, you know, he became so convinced that Christianity is teaching a message of, of peace and love and that, he's, and that it looks true and that he's being rightly guided. 
You know, and it does, and, and that's the thing about the Bible. The Bible does, you know, have this message where you feel like you're being guided. But the truth of the matter is, it's really misguidance. Because the Holy Quran actually exposes this delusion. It says inside chapter 4, verse 75, it says, And what is wrong with you that you fight not in the cause of Allah? What's wrong with you? Here, look how the Quran is criticizing you. For those who are weak, ill-treated, and oppressed among men, women, and children, whose cry is, Our Lord, rescue us from this town whose people are oppressors, and raise us from you one who will protect us. This is true guidance. Fighting for those who are oppressed. And so this is the violence which actually we are talking about inside last night's debate when the Quran promoted violence against non-believers. This is why... The Quran teaches to do that. This is right guidance. This is the golden rule that the world needs so badly. You know, literally, you look in the world today in the Congo, you can look in Libya, you can look in Rwanda, so many different places. People are praying this exact same prayer of chapter 4, verse 75. And that's what we need. But the Bible teaches us to be at peace with all men. You see, so there's a difference between the teachings of the Bible and the Quran. Because the Bible doesn't have this golden rule. And I think that's one of the problems. Therefore, the message which David gave us, though it sounds like goodness, it's cowardice. It's cowardice. You need to fight against people like Adolf Hitler. God wants you to do that. God wants you to fight against people like Pol Pot. Okay, so no, you should not be at peace with all men. Now the Christian might retort, well, I'm sure there's an exception to the rule to everything David said, and he's right. You know, he says, you know, you should have war and flesh and stuff like that. There are exceptions to the rule inside uh, the book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 4. It says over there, um, for he is a minister of God, it's talking about the rulers, for he is a minister of God to, uh, for good, for thou that do, oh, sorry, let me start again, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a minister of God. So he beareth not the sword in vain, he is a minister of God, a revenger to the, and, and who executes wrath upon those who do evil. So being at war with the flesh and all the verses, you know, my kingdom is not of this world, there are exceptions to this rule. And that is for the autocratic dictator, like the emperor Nero and Claudius. These were the Roman rulers at that time. And you know, it's really surprising, but a lot of Christians, they think this verse, I ask them, who do you think, who, who do you think this verse is talking about? So, well, Sarah Palin. This is not talking about Sarah Palin. This is not talking about George Bush. It's pointing to the Roman autocratic dictator and saying, you are doing God's work. Okay, when you wave, wave the sword, you know, but, and so I really don't want to get into the debate, does the Bible support autocratic dictators, but I, the important point here, which I want, to, want you to understand, there are exceptions to what David said. Now, he quoted a verse from the Bible, you know, in which Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world, for if it were, then I would order my followers to fight so that they would not hand me over to the Jews. So the condition, they, would, they do not fight in this specific condition so that they, do not, so that they would not hand Jesus over to the Jews in that specific context, that specific uh, situation. It is not saying that not to fight for me at all. That's a misreading of the text. Jesus gave a very specific circumstance so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. They would, they would not fight for that purpose. Okay? And anyways, there's many reasons you can fight. You know, when a person kills another person because they want him to become a Christian, he's not doing that to build some kind of kingdom, but he's doing it for the same reason why, you know, uh, David Wood would go to Dearborn and pass out flyers, to spread their religion. So there's many reasons to kill for your faith, not just to build some kind of kingdom, okay? Now, uh, let me go on over here. He says, all those who take up the sword shall die by the sword. Now, you know that's not true. There are many people who have taken up the sword, they live by the sword, but they did not die by the sword. So, I don't, uh, that's blatantly false, it's not true, there's many people who did. So I don't think we should take this 100% literally, but read it within context. 
that now these disciples, they're outnumbered. And in that situation, if you were to take up the sword, yes, you would die by the sword. Okay, but as I said, um, there's many exceptions to the rule. Romans chapter 13, verse 4, the, the autocratic dictator who uses a sword, you know, he's doing God's work. Okay? And of course, there's more exceptions than that. Um, for example, you know, the Bible says, be at peace with all men. Okay, well, and to love your enemy. Do you love Satan? Anyone here loves Satan? I don't think anybody here loves Satan. So there's more exceptions to the rule other than that. So let me go ahead and uh, let's talk about a specific exception to the rule here. Okay? And that's found inside the book of Chronicles, chapter 2, verse 12, verses 15. It says over there, Everyone who did not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, was put to death, whether small, great, man, or woman. Now let's just, well, let's just freeze over here. Who are we talking about? When we talk about Lord, well, David believes that it's Jesus who is God. They're like one in a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So it's really Jesus who is the God of Israel. Okay, Jesus is the God of Israel. So let's read that passage again. It says over here, that everyone who would not seek Lord Jesus, the God of Israel, was put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. Okay, so yes, there is a clear teaching that people who do not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior were put to death. Now, even if you're a Jehovah Witness, you don't believe Jesus is God, it doesn't matter. This is the values, these are the beliefs which Jesus Christ believes in. But now, here's something very interesting. Keep reading that passage. 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 15. Look what it says here. They sought God eagerly. He was fawned by them, by this, because they made this pledge. They made this promise, and it says over here, He was fawned by them. So the Lord gave them rest on every side, or gave them peace. So, so how did these Israelites get peace? By, by threatening people. If you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will be killed. That's what the Bible says. And it's very important here. Look the reaction of Jesus, or God, or whatever you want us to call it. He became happy. He became fond. So we see from the attributes and the sifat, or Arabic is sifat, from the attributes of God, what makes God happy? Brandishing knives at little kids. Think, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And if they don't, they are to be killed. Now, am I misreading this passage? Is it really? Uh, am, I, am I twisting it? It's right there in the Bible. And I would ask my opponent, David Wood, to come and please correct me. And I do want to lose this debate. I want, you know, I want him to show me that what I'm saying is wrong. Okay? Now, you know, David said, well, we don't follow the covenants and we don't follow the laws of the Old Testament. Understandable. Nobody is saying that you are under that covenant. And I know some people argue like that, but I'm not saying that. Because 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 12 to 15, has nothing to do with covenants. It has nothing to do with law, but with laws. But it's the Israelites they wanted to please God. And that's why they made that pledge. And God became very happy. Okay? So let's move on over here. So the question which I have for David Boyd. He's telling us today that God does not become happy by brandishing knives at little kids, wrestling them down, and saying, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and killing them? He's saying, this does not make God happy. Why is God changing? That contradicts what the Bible says. The Bible says God does not change in His attributes, His quality, His nature. From His nature, He becomes happy with us, but yet David is saying, God is not becoming happy. He's contradicting what the Bible teaches. Please explain that for us. Let's now move on to the New Testament. But before we do that, do you see an important point here? The peace is conditional. It's conditional. And we also found that there's an exception to the rules of the peace which David is talking about. Let's go to uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration by God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, 
correction and instruction unto righteousness. So the Bible here is saying that all scripture is profitable for you. So that which we just read, that's profitable for you, you Christians today, for doctrine, reproof, corrections and instruction done to righteousness. So my question for David Wood is, wrestling down little kids, brandishing eyes at them, and saying, will you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Which one of these four categories does it fit in? Is this your doctrine? Is this your reproof, correction, or instruction unto righteousness? Let's move on to the Luke mandate. As uh, David was actually alluding to, you know, um, Jesus says in this parable, But if those of my enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. And the immediate knee-jerk reaction is, you're taking that out of context. It's out of context. So, let's put this in context. And actually, David gave this context. And let's, let's elaborate on that. So, Jesus is telling this parable, you know, and, and he's giving this parable of a man. That, okay, this man, or a king, a ruler, gave ten bucks to this man, well, just not exactly ten bucks, I'll give you an example. Give ten bucks to this man, he goes away, and then he comes back, and he wants the money back. But he wants some profit on this. So the man gives the original ten bucks back without any profit. And then this ruler, this man, becomes angry. And that's when he utters this statement, which is, if those of my enemies, you know, wish that I do not reign upon them, Bring them hither and slay them before me. So the ruler here is clearly referring to Jesus here. He's showing himself as a ruler over here. And now Jesus is showing you how to make that profit by implementing Luke 19 chapter, Luke chapter 19 verse 27. So the moral lesson here is, this is a solution to that man's problem. You remember, he had no profit. Here is what the man should have done. So Jesus is correcting the man, and by implementing Luke 19.27, you will have that prophet, which Jesus will be looking for when he comes again. Now, at this point, we play a game, which is called this interpretation game. So, you know, oh, no, 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 let me give you another interpretation. That's fine. You can have your interpretation. One scripture can host different interpretations. But by giving me another interpretation, that doesn't show what I'm saying is wrong. That doesn't show the text or the, 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 the explanation which I just gave you. That doesn't show that's wrong. And that's my challenge for him tonight. I would ask him tonight, please show any exaggeration or errors in the explanation which I have given you. Of course you can come up with a more you know, palatable, a more sweet explanation or interpretation, that's fine. I'm not denying that Christians can't make a million interpretations off one scripture, but how is my wrong? Interpretation number two on this thing verse. The parable ends with verse 26. So now the parable ends, and now Jesus issues a command, which, let me read that verse to you again. So now there's no more parable, now we get a command from Jesus, which is said, I just want to make sure we, uh, you know, I don't want to misquote it. But those of mine enemies, which would, uh, which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. So the question is, how is that explanation wrong? Where, where is the error in that explanation? And my argument tonight is, those are legitimate, valid, and honest explanations of the text. But it doesn't stop there. We read inside Matthew chapter 10, verse 13. Jesus sends his his disciples out on a mission of preaching and healing. And look what he says over here. It's very interesting. He says, And if thy house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. So you see here, if the house, they are not willing to accept Jesus, let your peace return to you. And it continues, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake the dust off your feet. So it's very important here. What did the verse just say? Let your peace return back to you. Now I'm sure, you know, Christians, they will come up with a lot of different interpretations. When, when Jesus says, let your peace return to you, it really means continue to be peaceful. <laughs> and I'm sure people will try to interpret it that way. But my interpretation and my common sense explanation here is, let your peace return to you means you are not to be peaceful with them. This is an exception to the rule. 
You see, we, we remember we talked about exceptions to the rules which David gave us. Please tell us tonight, why is that explanation, why is that wrong? So, you know, I didn't want to give, you know, David a lot of arguments, you know, because I want to give him enough time to address this, and I hope he does. Uh, so just very quickly, just to recap, we talked about that the peace which David, be at peace with all men, and the verses which David was presenting, this is misguidance. And this is the problem which I have with the Bible and others. It, you feel like you're being guided, but in actuality, you're being misguided. The Holy Quran corrects this and says, fight for those people who are oppressed. 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 12 through 15 tells us that anyone who would not seek the Lord, whether young or old, was put to death. This was their pledge. And Jesus became happy, or God, or whatever you want to say that. We also looked at the Luke mandate. It's like Luke chapter 19, verse 27, and gave different explanations, which also work and are also logical. You need to come and tell us why those don't work. And uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing the explanation.